Thank you, Rajul. Thank you for the introduction. Let me present my screen. Is it visible, Rajul? Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, I am Aparna Banerjee, and today I am going to talk on uh, to the kids. Like, if you are facing any problem and you feel like to stop me at that point and ask me, like, if if there is some difficulty to understand what I am telling, please feel free. So that, like, we will not delve into the detailing and we will be lost somewhere. So, wherever you feel like you have not. Uh, some knowledge on that field, please feel free to let me know. Of course, we cannot go in all the details, but I will try my best so that you can understand something. So, in this, the field of microbiology is very interesting because in microbiology, we know that we cannot see anything. What we cannot see that is microbiology because we see them under a microscope. But actually, we can sometimes see the microbes in our open naked eyes also when the all microbes live together and they form some colorful film in the water bodies or in soil or in rock so that time we can sometimes see microbes in a big colony also so it's like the population of microbes that we call biofilm but otherwise we can only see under the microscope so if we see them under the microscope how to know them who are they there comes the bioinformatics in microbiology. So like bioinformatics and microbiology are very much together. And uh, that is the reason we need to study bioinformatics to understand microbiology. So the idea of bioinformatics started a little late compared to microbiology. Microbiology started long back, but the idea of bioinformatics came in the late 90s and the early 2000s. So first, Bioinformatics was known as the application of computational tools because we know that bioinformatics we all do using a computer. If we in the home, if we have a computer, we have a laptop, we have a notebook, we can see and understand bioinformatics. So the application of computational tools to organize, analyze, understand, visualize and store information associated with biological macromolecules. Now, what are macromolecules? We know molecules, isn't it? The small uh, what is the difference between an atom and a molecule? The atom is the tiniest part of a material. Can be a biological material, can be a material, but we cannot break it further. Otherwise, the property of chem the chemical property will be lost. So when the atoms are together, they form molecules. Like for example, a hydrogen atom and oxygen atom, when they come together, they form water molecule. And we know that the water molecule are base of life, isn't it? So when the water molecule and some other molecule, few molecules join together, they form macromolecules. Macro is like molecules, but macro, macromolecules. So these macromolecules, what they do, the macromolecules in our in, in the human body, in plant body, in microbial body, in all the living beings form a very crucial role. They form proteins, they form, form lipids, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA, ribonucleic acid, or lipids. So they form the basic components of the body. DNA, RNA, protein, polysaccharides, or carbohydrates. These are all the macromolecules. So what bioinformatics do? Bi we have large amount of data, isn't it? This is a huge data. So what bioinformatics do? All these macromolecules, they organize it, analyze these macromolecules, why? To understand it and to see it. To see it in, in form of, uh, in an understandable structure. And then further, they store this information so that we, whenever we can, we can retrieve them from a, st from a database. So this is what bioinformatics was initially called or understood. But the term bioinformatics was long before coined in 1970s. So there was a female researcher and a male researcher, Pauline Hodgweg and Ben Hesper, they both, uh, they both in 1970s termed the, uh, coined the term bioinformatics and they told it as a study of informatic process in biotic system. So bio 
and informatics, bioinformatics, studying the informatic process in biotic system. Actually, nowadays what we understand bioinformatics is like computational biology, but computational biology deals mainly with the modeling of biological system. Model it with some mathematical modeling or biological modeling, but bioinformatics have the main components. They develop the software or the tools and the algorithms and then analyze and interpret the biological data using this variety of softwares or tools or algorithms. So the main difference between computational biology that computational biology only model the biological system, but bioinformatics, they develop the software and then analyze and interpret the biological data using those softwares. So now these are like just to give an idea of bioinformatics. I think you have got the idea of bioinformatics in last two classes or three classes also. So now let us talk about what are the type of microbes. Microbes is a very general term. We always use microbes like we feel microbes are all together similar. No, there are a lot of microbes. For example, if we call animals, there are a lot of animals. There are cats, dogs, we humans, there are ants, there are birds, a lot of animals. Same for microbes. There are bacteria, there are archaea because microbes... It's a big kingdom, just like plant kingdom, animal kingdom, microbial kingdom. So there are bacteria, there are archaea, there are fungi, algae, protozoa, virus. All these together are called microbes because we cannot see them using our naked eye. They are unicellular and we have to see them under the microscope. That is the reason they are called microbes. But you know, sometimes the fungi are even multicellular like the mushroom that we take. That is fungi. That is not a microbe. So fungi, the unicellular fungi are microbes. Yeast is a type of fungi that is also a microbe. So the bacteria, we can see bacteria uh, under the microscope, but they are basically omnipresent all around the world in air. If we are in a room, in the room there is microorganism or bacteria. In, in a plant root in soil, near the, so, uh, near the root and soil, this part, or in the soil, there is bacteria. In water, there is bacteria. The same for fungi also. Algae, they are present in the moist part inside the water or near the plant root. Protozoa also present in water. Virus in air, in water, in soil, everywhere. Archaea are normally present in the environment that is a little toxic environment for the living being. But this inhospitable environment, normally the archaea leaves bacteria also. So, in all the impossible or inhospitable environment in our planet Earth, or even can be extracellular uh, or can be the extraterrestrial life in other uh, planets, there can be the presence of microorganism because we cannot see them. And also the microorganism not necessarily they only grow using oxygen. We need oxygen for our life, isn't it? For, for respiration, we need oxygen and we in, inhale oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide out, but not necessarily for the microorganism, for the bacteria, for the archaea. They can even survive using hydrogen sulfide. They can even survive using carbon monoxides, carbon dioxide. So in all kind of inhospitable environment in our planet, are they 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 thrive or they they live totally okay so if we think like in india for example in himalaya himalaya is a permafrost region it is always snow there but inside the snow there is microorganism or for example if we think in maharashtra there is lonar lake lonar lake is a high salt concentration lake so microorganism is there also or if we think uh, a run of kutch it's a very hyper uh, saline environment. Microorganism is present there also. Or for example, in Andaman Nicobar Island, there is a mud volcano called Baratang. So there is also microorganism living. Or the hot springs in Manikaran. Microorganisms are living there too. So in all this environment where the pH is very high, the temperature is very high or very low, too much salt, too much metals, or even in, in the desert of Thor, probably there is microorganism, or even in nuclear contaminated sites, microorganisms have the capacity to grow. Now, all these microorganisms that are everywhere can be algae, can be fungi, can be bacteria, can be archaea. 
why when we there is a vast area of microbes and they literally help our planet earth to be as the planet earth is because what the microorganism do they maintain the biogeochemical cycles of our planet earth so what is these biogeochemical cycles carbon cycle nitrogen cycle oxygen cycle sulfur cycle all these cycles if they are not maintained the the diversity or the balance of planet earth will be disbalanced isn't it so all need to be reutilized and microorganisms they reutilize it also you know we talk that plants are basically a huge producer of uh, uh, oxygen but you know actually in the sea the microscopic organism the autotrophic microorganism they produce a major amount of oxygen in our planet earth because we know that in our planet the majority is water the sea water content so they are they are producing oxygen also so they are balancing all these basic elements of our planet earth so if at one one microorganism is not working probably the entire balance of the cycles will be hampered but when we talk about microbes we fear sometimes microbes and after the covid we fear them more isn't it like we think that bad microbes bad bacteria and good bacteria so we always have this idea of good and bad bacteria good and bad microbes actually you know there is nothing called good and bad microbes when a lot of microbes when they infect us the human we get infected but the same microorganism when they infect probably a cat the cats don't in get infected or for example some microorganisms are just the the microorganism that is not impacting anything to our body but what happens when our body is weak our immunological condition is weak we cannot fight that much with the microorganisms they suddenly become bad microorganism or bad bacteria so we always need to have healthy foods we always need to keep our health good so that we have that power to fight with the microorganism and in comparison if we compare good bacteria in our body we have a lot of good bacteria isn't it for example the helpful escherichia coli they help our um, our body also to get the vitamins to or for example the good common cells bacteria inside our body they are also helping us to maintain our system of the bowel this is the reason when we have some diarrhea or this kind of thing we rapidly take some um take some drink that is like a lactobacillus drink called yakult or when we have some uh, stomach ache or sometimes a diarrhea after that uh, our parents give us a lot of curds isn't it because curd have lactobacillus inside it and that's also a good bacteria that helps our body so let us not think like good and bad bacteria today we are only going to talk about good bacteria because if there is 100% of bacteria believe me 99% of them are till now not known only 1% of them are known till date and this huge 99% that we don't know there comes a lot of metagenomics so we cannot even see them we cannot even culture them so only we can understand them using sequencing and in the rest to 1% actually their 0.99% is actually good microorganism and the rest 0.1% is the microorganisms that are pathogenic so today we are only going to focus on the good and not on the bad so how can we see and identify a bacteria isn't it when they are so small because we are talking about microorganism micro and if they are micro how can we see them because they are so small there comes this use of microscope i don't know if in the school you have see microscope or not or in some uh, little fairs if you have seen some microscope also you know sometimes it sells pocket microscope and are very nice like you can put a drop of water in those pocket microscope and you can see bacteria inside the water so i suggest you all you all can try that also buying some pocket microscopes if in the if in your next birthday you can ask from your parents to gift you a pocket microscope because in, in some uh, online stores it really sells cheap and you can see the microorganisms in this size it's really nice so how can we see them for that normally if you see under microscope the bacteria you can see the micro the microscope have a light source and the light source will pa pass through the through the microorganism and you will see like a black spot for the bacteria 
but if we want to see them with color if we want to understand which bacteria it is the first time this method gram staining was developed so gram staining was was a method to stain and distinguish and classify the bacterial species into two large groups gram positive and gram negative bacteria so this gram stain basically a lot of chemicals are used for gram staining we use a dye called crystal violet then after putting the dye in that water sample we so that the dye uh, enter inside the microorganism we put some mordant grams iodine it's iodine solution then we wash the sample and after that we put us another stain saffron in so what is the idea of this this gram positive bacteria they have a big wall a thick wall cell wall so if the stain enters inside it's a gram positive bacteria because when it entered inside if you wash it with alcohol also it will not go out but in case of gram negative bacteria they have a really thin cell wall so when you wash it with alcohol the stain goes out and then you put saffron in and you can only see pink color saffron in is pink and crystal violet violet is violet color from crystal violet the name you can understand so you can see that in the image some are violet gram positive bacilli or rod shaped bacteria and some are pink gram negative bacilli or rod shaped bacteria so or we can even see some cocci that are um, uh, small cocci together also so can be some diplococcus kind of bacteria so uh, this was a big classification that some that take the gram stain are gram positive some that don't take the gram stain crystal violet are gram negative but actually nowadays we know that not all bacteria can be stained with gram stain for example mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bad bacteria that cause tuberculosis in our body but cannot be stained with gram staining because their cell wall have mycolic acid and mycolic acid is like a wax so the wax are very hard isn't it when we put candle in our home we know that the candle is liquid when we put fire otherwise the candle doesn't melt so for understanding my the mycolic acid the mycobacterium tuberculosis we have to heat the cell so that the wax get melted and then the stain get entered so not all the microorganism can be stained with gram staining but a huge number of microorganism can be stained so for this we just need a compound microscope the compound microscope sometime have a light source sunlight sometime have a bulb like a electric bulb and we put the plug in the uh, switchboard and then the directly the light gets on and we can see the sample so there is optical microscope with a compound lens system and an external light source the light source can be sunlight the light source can be a bulb but what we see the microorganism they are very small isn't it very very small we cannot see what is there inside there comes lot of other microscopy so for example electronic microscopy in electronic microscopy we don't use light we use electron and this electronic microscopy scanning electron microscope we can see the surface of the bacteria and you see in the left how clear the microorganisms are then in the right the transmission electron microscopy we can the electron secondary electrons they goes inside the microorganism and it literally scans the microbes and we can see the inside of the bacteria also how they look then comes confocal microscope or even can be fluorescence or epifluorescence microscope so we use some fluorescence light and we can stain the microorganism with different stain and we can see them colored and then there comes atomic force microscope this is really interesting because the atomic force microscope shows the microorganism three dimensionally you can see how like you like it's someone imprinted a 3d graph isn't it so the only micro microscopic technique where we can see the three dimensional view of a microorganism is atomic force microscopy and there we see the microorganisms really big and this is the way we can see and sometimes identify a bacteria why because the bacilli almost look same isn't it they almost look same. for example if we are thinking of a bacillus cereus and we are thinking of a bacillus anthracis they almost look same almost only bacillus cereus sometimes a little smaller and bacillus anthracis a little bigger in size but often the bacillus anthracis are little smaller in size also some varieties so it's really difficult to distinguish between these two bacteria using microscope none of the microscope can distinguish them who are they 
until and unless we really identify them using some sequencing technique. So there comes the bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is the torch bearer. If we want to identify a bacterium, I don't know if you have ribosome already studied in your biology classes. Have you studied ribosome before? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So if you studied ribosome in prokaryotes, it's 7TS ribosome. And in case of eukaryotes, it's 8TS ribosome. Say so this is our Svedberg unit. So in case of prokaryotes, 50S is the large subunit and 30S is the smaller subunit. And in case of eukaryote, 60S is the large subunit and 40S is the smaller subunit. So let us talk about prokaryote because we are talking now about microorganisms or bacteria, prokaryotic system. Can be bacteria, can be archaea. So this 30S, molar 50S large subunit, they have 23S RNA, 5S RNA and some protein. And the 16S, they have, and the 30 year subunit, they have 16 S RRNA and some ribosomal protein. So basically, they have some RRNA. Ribosome is nothing but some RRNA and some protein. Ribosomal RNA and some protein. What is the use of this 30 S? This 30 S is the actual contributing subunit which will help us to understand the microorganism. You know why? Because ribosome first. Ribosome is present in all bacterial species. All prokaryotes need to have ribosome because without ribosome, we cannot get from DNA to RNA to RNA to protein. So basically, they are doing this. They are maintaining this. So it is present in all bacterial species. Then the 16S RNA gene sequencing, why is the most common method? Because it targets the housekeeping genes. You know what is housekeeping genes? Like for example, what is what for us is indispensable in a house? If that thing is not in the home, the house doesn't function. It's like that. So, for example, this 16S RRNA in all the bacteria are widely present. And for every species, they are same. They never change. So, the 16S RRNA sequence of Escherichia coli is not the, the same with Bacillus. So, the sequence change. And because the structure or the sequence change, we can identify if we see what is component in RNA, we can understand which bacteria it is. So this is the reason 16S RRNA gene sequencing. This is the housekeeping gene of the bacteria. There are a lot of other housekeeping also, but the most universal one is the 16S RRNA. So we using this, we study the bacterial phylogeny and we classify the genus or the species. It also assists to differentiate between the closely related bacterial species. And in all the clinical laboratory, when there is some pathogenic strain, they identify the pathogenic strain using the 16S RRNA gene sequencing. And you know, sequencing method is basic. Using sequencing, we can get to know the identification of all the microorganisms, not necessarily 16S, but some days back when we came to know what is a covid that is the time also we, we sequenced the virus to understand what was COVID-19. So to identify any virus, any bacteria, any microorganisms or any organism, we need to do their sequence. So using the sequencing method, we understand what is which species. According to the proposed guideline of classification of bacteria, if the, the RNA strain of, of the bacteria that we are sequencing have more than 97% similarity with the target, then it is the same bacterial species. If not, we have to go for alternative approach. We have to go to more deeper uh, identification method to understand. So if it's more than 97%, for example, we get a microorganism for, from a water sample and we are trying to know what is the microorganism because it is showing like a bacillus and we are thinking it's a bacillus subtilis. It's a bacillus serious. It's a bacillus thuringiensis. Which bacillus it is? So we did the sequencing. And if we see, okay, this bacillus is a serious because showing more than 97% similarity or 100% similarity with bacillus serious. So this is the same bacterial species. If not, we have to go for some alternative approach. So why we need to know microorganism? Because microbes are in our daily life. In Every moment of our life, we are using microorganisms. Starting from the food, 
in the for example every day we are taking paneer isn't it paneer almost we all love i don't know i to love paneer if you if you love paneer or not i love paneer i love carbs and all of these are microorganism or if we are thinking medicine in medicine also regularly we are using microorganisms the even nutraceuticals for example that i was talking about some probiotic capsules that is also having some microorganism if we are thinking about a waste water treatment plant in waste water treatment plant also we use micro because the microbes sometimes have flocculating capacity so the when there is the uh, the impurified waste water the microbe react with them precipitate the uh, impurities down and the free clean water is up and with the pipe they goes out so the microorganisms are used in the waste water treatment plant also and finally in the rhizosphere in the soil when there is a plant the plant have roots isn't it and this root is a is an environment is a micro environment so the root and the soil this micro environment or the rhizosphere also have the microbiome and they help the plant to grow the, the they help the plant to tolerate some stress like nowadays we know in there are a lot of changes in temperature drought or salinity stress the soil is becoming saline soil so what the microorganism do they help the plant to tolerate this stress they protect the plant against pathogen they give the plants nutrient because the microbe have the capacity to break down the complex organic compounds and they give those elemental nutrients to the plant and then help the plant in its fight physiology and metabolism and in order of this what the microorganism get they also get nutrients from the plant so it's like a very symbiotic relationship between the plant and the microorganism in the rhizosphere so basically whatever we are seeing in our daily life beside us there is some microorganism working without telling us or we probably don't know but we are we are getting the help or benefit of microorganism every day in our life so now just to give an overview of what how we do like the sequencing first we isolate a bacteria we have some di different medias in the microbiology lab if we isolate the bacteria in those media when the bacteria is isolated Related, we extract the DNA, then we amplify the 16s rRNA gene and sequence a portion of the 16s rRNA gene, and finally we compare that sequence in GenBank. It's a database to obtain a match. If there is a match, if there is more than 97% similarity, we get to know which bacteria it is, which microorganism it is. If not, then we have to go for some alternative approach. But that is a very rare case. so we probably all know what is this amplification we all have done pcr isn't it during the time of covid we all have came to know about polymerase chain reaction or pcr so basically there is a equipment called thermal cycler and this thermal cycler run the polymerase chain reaction and amplify the 16s rrna gene and then when we have a lot amount of that particular 16s rrna gene we sequence the portion using a sequencer so there are the standard sequencing method that we will not go into much deep because those are more hard part of the biology but bioinformatics believe me is the basic bioinformatics is much more simple than that if you like playing games video games or some games in the computer or in your mobile you will love bioinformatics i'm sure because you can get the data directly in your telephone or directly in your computer so uh, we will we will see also the hands on of this how to how to do and what are these databases so and then we will see a little about the proteins because ultimately proteins of microbial pro microbial origin proteins or microbial enzymes that we are regularly using in our daily life so we will see a little how the proteins looks like using the bioinformatics actually the proteins looks like a different structure when they are in some basic structure they are called primary insulin hormone have some primary structure then when they get coiled we call them secondary structure they can form some helix some strand some deep coils when the coil get bent it's called tertiary structure like the albumin protein in egg that is a tertiary structure actin tubulin and in our blood the hemoglobin is a quaternary structure so when two tertiary come together and get joined they are quaternary structure so 
this is how the proteins looks like not necessarily the microbials protein the plant origin protein the um, uh, animal origin protein almost all the protein looks similar so it's nothing like something different they look similar but this is how the protein looks like and the microbial proteins we use them in our regular life the daily life so we will see a little how to identify a bacteria or which microorganism it is and then how the protein looks like their structure and which database we can go into delve into to and to get this uh, source of the information the dna sequence or the protein sequences okay so will be difficult but if we can surmount it there will be the glory that's a very beautiful line of epicurus because the greater the difficulty the more the glory in surmounting it till now was it clear so that we can go into the uh, hands on uh, ma'am could you please explain what you mentioned on the last slide about how proteins look like okay so the pro i, I will better go into the presentation mode again is it visible yes ma'am okay so actually what is protein when we have some dna the dna gets into rna and the rna changes into protein isn't it that's how the proteins are formed but we actually using bioinformatics can look how the proteins we were talking about dna and now we are about protein how the proteins look like of course the proteins also we can look down the microscope my of course not the simple microscope like the compound microscope but using electron microscope yes but using bioinformatics also we can see the structure of the proteins of the microbial proteins and the microbial protein if i give an example like lipase every day we use lipase in medicine uh, why lipase is used in the biomedical field because of to treat the adipose tissue we use lipase or if it's amylase to break the, break the uh, carcinogenic protein often protease enzymes are said in protease is used or if we are talking about serratia peptide serratia peptide is also used to break down the proteins if we are talking about food industry in food industry also used a lot of glucose isomerase enzymes produced by the bacteria in the cup syrup and you know in last to last uh, session Yes, one session back we had the batch of Naya Mehta, and that that I always try to talk about because they have worked into this enzyme glucose and xylose isomerase, and that that project got published, and it was published in a good journal, and and it was just like worked by school students like you all. So that I always talk to everywhere because if the school students can can go go deep into by a subject like bioinformatics, believe me, bioinformatics is simpler than what we think. so um, we we that 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 was the year that we looked into the uh, structure of this xylose and isomerase enzyme that have a lot of use in food industry in 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 some uh, fructose syrup in cup syrup we use these enzymes a lot if we talk about keratinase enzyme keratinase enzyme is used a lot in cosmeceutical industry so that is also a work that has been done by the bix school students so together with dr renuka abjal um professors that have given the class to the kids the kids have worked beautifully in that enzyme also so we have tried to see some uh, component of acne because we know that acne grows into the skin isn't it and this keratinase enzyme is used to treat the acne so we have uh, seen the docking how the keratinase enzyme microbial keratinase enzyme have their specificity to fight acne so we will also see a little how the proteins look like because that is some basic part it's not like how, what we can do in the project we can do some more details of this also but i just want to show what are the different structure of proteins how we can see them using the bioinformatic tools because the primary structure is just like a like a thread and then this thread is made of amino acids of course a lot of amino acids join together and they form a protein insulin hormone is an example of this protein primary structure then when you have a thread and you have this uh, thread and you are trying to make it a coil so this coil is a secondary structure you bend the coil 
it become a tertiary structure you have one coil in your hand and you take another coil you join these two coils together it's a quaternary structure hemoglobin in our blood or dna polymerase enzyme is quaternary structure uh, to give the example of tertiary structure of protein albumin egg albumin is a tertiary structure of protein so we will be seeing a little which are the databases that we will be seeing today to get the dna sequence the rna sequence and also to to get the protein sequences and to do a little hands on so rajul should i go into uh, into the hands on now okay yes ma'am oh. i'm i'm going to write here the link so that you can rapidly open it okay we are going to work on on ncbi we are also putting a link of pdb where we will be going into to see the proteins so rcsp org i first put the both the link so okay i i was, I was not sure what was i showing <clears throat> so we are in ncbi i i hope you all have opened it so in ncbi if we see this part of all databases there are a lot of option you can see that there is gene there is genome then there is nucleotide so let us come into this nucleotides because when we are talking about a small gene sequence like a 16s rrna genes these are nucleotides so let us select this nucleotide and for example you can put any bacteria that you know the name i am going to put a very simple one that we probably all know lactobacillus so it directly shows us that there are almost almost 6 lakh of lactobacillus rna sequences we can see that there are a lot of lactobacillus here lactobacillus plantarum lactobacillus crispatus lactobacillus delbrueckii so all other taxa we can go into more details here so we can see if we go down there are a lot of sequences given so let us just choose any lactobacillus 16s rna sequence we open it so when we open the 16s sequence if we go to this fasta fasta is just a format basically this sig sign if we see in the beginning this sign is called a fasta this greater than sign is called a fasta format so it's just a format of bioinformatics don't worry much about that this is the way that the sequence are are, are known by the system so this greater than sign this is the reason it's used so this is the whole 16s rrna sequence normally you know what is the number of bases in a 16s rrna sequence because if we are talking about deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid they have the base isn't it adenine thymine cytosine guanine uracil so these are the common bases that are in dna and rna so there are almost 1500 base pairs sometimes can be a little less sometime can be a little low, low it's if if it's complete sequence can be 1498 1400 base pairs if no there can be 
1200, 1100, depend on the primers that we are using. So when we have this, we will going to run BLAST because you can see in the right side, there will be some analyze this sequence. So if we going to run BLAST, you, we click it. It will directly go into the BLAST page. What is BLAST? Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. What it do, does, it has the sequence and it's that align basic sequences and then search what are the similar sequences to this sequence. So that is the reason the name is Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. So we can see the query sequence number is given here. We go more down and then here in part of this, we just select RRNA sequence and then there are 16S, 18S, 20S, 28S, ITS region for the fungi because the fungi have uh, fungi are eukaryote and eukaryote have 80s ribosome so if you are searching for a fungi you have to select again here rrna and its database but you have to choose probably fungi in case of we are searching a bacteria or a archaea these are prokaryotes so we will be selecting 16s ribosomal rrna sequence so this is the database so here you is your query sequence you can even put your faster sequence here. So if you are having a raw sequence data, you don't know which bacteria it is. You just paste the sequence here. And then you go down and here in the database. So this is your database that your sequence will search into and will align with them all. And after aligning them with all, it will get to know <coughs> which species it is. So highly similar sequence, the way it is, we will select and we will put into blast <coughs> it will take a few time so we can see it's showing a lot of similar sequences and you see till where it's showing more than 97 percent similarity with a lot because here, look, it's showing 100% identity with Lactobacillus mullerys, then 99.67% similarity with Lactobacillus genseni, 99.53 with another genseni, 99.65 with a Lactobacillus formicalis, then directly 93. So basically, these four, these four are our candidates, isn't it? Because after that, it is not showing more than 97% similarity. It's only showing 93%. But basically, it is a lactobacillus mullerys because showing 100% similarity. Query cover is also 100%. We can see. So basically, 100% of the strain got, got similar with the 100% of a lactobacillus mullerys. And we can come to know which bacteria it is. So what we can do here. We can deselect it and we can select the one that we only want to see. Maybe we select the top 10. And we go into graphic summary. You can see how they are showing. This is our query sequence. And this is the sequences that we have selected. We go into alignment. You can see that they are aligned to with all the, this is how they are aligned. The uh, cytosine is aligned with cytosine. The guanine is aligned with guanine. So the entire basis is aligned with the base of another 16A sequence of another bacteria. Then we go into taxonomy and we can also see what are the different taxonomies are. Like for example, lactobacillus mullerys is a Farmicutes kind of bacteria. So this is the way that we can see a lot of lot of uh, details of the microorganism from which family it is even. So we go into distance tree of result here. And it directly for, makes a phylogeny for us. And you can see 
this is how it's forming the direct phylogeny that our farm our farmicutes this uh, lactobacillus is showing the similarity with another lactobacillus and it's we can the method also can be changed can be changed with never joining tree method we can difference the sequence maximum sequence difference we can make give some title to the um, uh, to the phylogenetic tree and then when it's done we can download them also in pdf format we can also upload the data here if we are trying to upload a sequence data so using this ncbi tool we can save the image we can get to know which family it is we can understand the description with which bacteria it is showing the similarity how it's getting the alignment we can see and we can also see how they are aligned not with the sequence but just with colors so <coughs> ultimately if we have a sequence we can get to know if we have a unknown sequence of a microorganism and we don't know which microorganism it is which bacteria it is we can just come into ncbi blast we put the sequence here and then if it's a bacteria you are thinking then you just select it here rrna database and because if you are not selecting it will be aligning with a plant dna it will be aligning with a fungal dna it will be aligned with any dna it will get so to make the uh, screening more perfect we are selecting rrna and then we select 16s rrna and then we just make blast when you have the blast it shows something like this that then you have to see with which uh, microorganism it is showing more than 70 uh, 97% similarity you select them and you go to you can see a different options graphic summary alignment taxonomy and basically here you get the distance tree of result if you go in this distance tree of result you get the phylogenetic tree also and the phylogenetic tree you download and you save it so that you can further understand which microorganism it was and what phylogenetic identification it has given till this part it's clear yes ma okay so now let us go a little into rcsb if you can open a little your rcsb please the link is given there have you opened it now i'm just opening it okay so when you open it you get similar like ncbi if we go into ncbi these are all databases you know so they have saved they have stored a lot of data dna data rna data protein data so there are these are these are the databases that we were talking we started the class the processes in the biological system it's it uh, store and analyze the data so these are the storage uh, boxes where the data are stored so when we open in case of ncbi here you search and in case of rcsb you search here look here so for example um, we let us search uh lipases because lipases we use a lot in in biomedical field so when we got lipases look here in the scientific name of source here also you can select a lot just like ncbi i look in the left you can select just the bacteria so there are 811 lipase sequences from just the bacteria imagine so if we are selecting for example here escherichia coli i'm trying to get the refine but i don't know why it's not changing okay here it is yes 
So if we are seeing, uh, he, 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 here is a phospholipase from Escherichia coli. And if we click this, in you know, in RCSB page, every sequence have a date, have a four digit PDB ID. So they are like making this four digit for all the possible uh, protein sequences. So when we work more into protein, we just remember the four digit code that which protein we are working with. So for example, we click one lipase, we click the link and you see, we can see the DNA, we can see the protein, how it looks like. And it's showing different assemblies. Look, it's showing in beautifully in colors. For example, this is a coil we were talking about. This is a, some beta bridge and look, with, connected with beta turns. There is a coil that we were talking about, different structures of proteins. And here we get all the details that it is from Escherichia coli. It's a membrane protein. And if we go here into display file, faster sequence, it will be showing us the sequence also. So basically it have two chains and chain A, three chains, chain A and chain B and chain C. It was probably a partially purified. So it's showing chain A and chain C and it's giving us all the sequence. So if we go to download file, we can download in all the format, in master format, in PDF format, in all the formats that we are thinking of. So just to show you, for example, we go to faster sequence, And we select some protein uh, sequences. And if we go into a tool called Expassy, Expassy is expert protein analysis system. So this uh, Expassy is also basically a, a database which keeps protein sequences and also analyze the protein. So if we paste our protein sequence here and we compute the parameter, I will not go into too much details into it. You can search as the proteins that you think in RCSB database, but look, it gives us the entire amino acid composition, which amino acid it is made up of. Like for example, we can see it have 10% leucine. So we can see what are the positively charged amino acid, what are the negatively charged amino acid, we can see what is the half-life, the half-life of this protein in the mammalian system, in the yeast system, in the Escherichia coli. Then we get that the protein is instable or stable. So this, there is called instability index. If it's more than 40, the protein is unstable. If it's less than 40, the protein is stable. So we see that it's 17.65. So that means that the protein is stable. We also got, got to see a lot of parameters of the protein here. So using protparam, we get to see the primary structure of the protein. So using protparam, we can get to know about what the protein is made up of. The protein is made up of which amino acids. And this is the details that we are getting from protparam that if we are getting a sequence from uh, RCSB database, we copy and paste the sequence and we put into the protparam. And then you can probably make some graph, which is the format you can download also. It's in CSV format, so it's get downloaded. And we get to know how many number of amino acids are. For example, the protein is made up of 240 amino acid. What is the molecular weight? What is the theoretical PI of the um, uh, uh, protein? So we get a lot of basic information, physiological, physio physicochemical characters and the uh, primary structure of the protein. So I think we will be probably stopped here only because if Rajul, there are some students that have interested to go into the, uh, the project, we can go into more details of different protein structure and probably we can be working with uh, uh, more the more different sequences also from microorganism, but we can go into more deep. But I think if we go into secondary tertiary structure, it will be very much um, like uh, deep, so that that probably will be difficult to understand. Yeah, correct, ma'am. They they I think now have the basic idea if they are mm -hmm. going to pursue the project, what kind of work they'll be doing. So, uh, any questions from you students? Nitya, did you, uh, did you, can you, could you do the uh, exercises? 
um i i was able to do it halfway but because i've joined from my tablet so it was a little bit of a technical issue but i did do it okay um i think adil uh, manzoor can you please uh, switch on your mic and camera also and if we could talk about bit um hello yeah who's there I'm Simal. Yeah, Simal, could you do the exercises today? Um, sorry, but I'm on mobile, so. Your voice is so. uh, fading, Simal. Can you be a bit la- louder? Um, I'm sorry. Um, I cannot do that because I am. I joined this meeting on my mobile. Okay. Did you understand the concept? Yes. Okay. And Krishna. Yes, ma'am. Did you understand today's class? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, wonderful, ma'am. Yeah, you all can ask questions if you want to. Also, after the class, if they are going into like trying in the home, and if they find the difficulties, if some difficulty, they can write in the WhatsApp group. so so that i can understand which part they have difficulty i can probably make a small video to share like how to do it again yeah perfect ma'am uh ma'am i just wanted to ask like chromatin is also a type of protein right and you mm-hmm. talked about how there are primary <coughs> proteins and secondary proteins and tertiary proteins so like mm-hmm. which category will chromatin lie in uh in case of chromatin protein if you are if if it, it tell me the structure a little of the chromatin protein if it's only dna or it is having some other things in chromatin also ma'am i'm not quite sure because in our science textbook it usually just says that there's chromatin, chromatin. in the nucleus and nothing yes, chromatin more. is protein chromatin is protein but chromatin is a complex of dna and protein together isn't it so when the dna and protein is together it forms a coil isn't it so it is not directly a protein chromatin is a structure it's not a protein so the protein of chromatin is separate that can have some structure but that is the reason i give the example of of a hemoglobin of human body or for example egg albumin that have tertiary structure but in case of chromatin is a compact structurization of the of the dna isn't it so the dna they are getting compacted using the protein and they form a chromatin structure so this is basically a complex between dna and protein so the which is the structure of the protein that we have to see but chromatin directly is not a protein dna is also involved over there so we cannot tell that it is a primary structure or secondary structure but if you were talking about some protein like a protein or an enzyme directly for example in this case insulin hormone in our body which is a protein so we can insulin hormone is 151 amino acid long and it's its primary structure of protein. so um it's not it is not having this kind of structure thank you <clears throat> i think ma'am this bring us to the end of the lecture your uh, talk was very precise and very informative today Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you for joining. Thank you. Please let us know if you have any queries. Okay, okay. I'm also attentive to hear. <laughs> have a good day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Have a good bye, bye ma'am.